Hello and welcome to day two of the Lowy Institute's digital conference on the Indo-Pacific Operating System, Power, Order and Rules for the 21st Century. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, as well as traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Yesterday, we opened this conference with a conversation with Kurt Campbell, the Indo-Pacific Coordinator at the US National Security Council. Kurt's remarks to me on the United States, China, Australia and AUKUS have made news around the world. We also hosted a keynote speech by French security expert and Lowy Institute non-resident fellow Nadege Roland and two panels on the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. You can watch all of these sessions through the conference portal or via the Lowy Institute's YouTube channel. Shortly, we'll host our third and final panel of the conference on hard power and regional order. But first, I'd like to introduce Australia's Defence Minister, the Honourable Peter Dutton MP, to deliver his ministerial remarks. Mr Dutton entered the Australian Parliament two decades ago as the member for Dixon. He served as a minister in a number of portfolios, including as the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection and the Minister for Home Affairs, and he served on the National Security Committee of the Cabinet for the past six years. In March this year, he was appointed Minister for Defence. I'd like to thank the Minister for agreeing to speak to this conference and invite him to deliver his remarks. The Lowy Institute is one of Sir Frank Lowy's great legacies to our country. Michael, you've played an essential role in bringing Sir Frank's vision to reality and building the Lowy Institute into a respected voice on both the national and international stage. The Institute helps to define and shape the Australian foreign policy and security debate. And I thank you for the invitation to address this conference on the Indo-Pacific operating system. Today, our region, the Indo-Pacific, is of course far more complex and far less predictable than at any time since the Second World War. We're facing challenges including rapid military modernisation, tension over territorial claims, heightened economic coercion, undermining of international law, including the law of the sea, through to enhanced disinformation, foreign interference and cyber threats enabled by new and emerging technologies. In the discussions I have with our like-minded friends in the region, the message comes through loud and clear. They share our interest in ensuring continued peace and prosperity. They want to see the Indo-Pacific operating system characterised by order and stability. And the Australian government is stepping up its engagement with our Pacific partners, and we're working even more closely with our allies and friends. These include our Five Eyes partners, NATO, the Quad, ASEAN, European countries, including Germany, which sent its first warship in 20 years for a goodwill visit to the region this year. We support ASEAN centrality in our regional security architecture. Australia continues to work constructively with our many bilateral strategic partners and with our long-standing friends and allies, the United States and the United Kingdom. We are working together to shape a prosperous and free region. Over the past few months, the Australian Defence Force took part in a number of back-to-back -back exercises with allied forces in our region. It was a landmark time for a number of reasons. It was the second consecutive year that Australia had been invited to participate in Exercise Malabar with India, Japan and the United States. Exercise Basama Gold marked the golden jubilee of the five power defence arrangements with Australia joining with Malaysia, Singapore, the UK and New Zealand for a range of maritime and air exercises. The maritime partnership exercise between Australia, the US, the UK and Japan included the United Kingdom's first carrier strike group and that was deployed outside of Europe for the first time since the Falklands War. In October, HMAS Warramunga joined international efforts to enforce United States Security Council sanctions on North Korea, the sixth Australian warship to do so. And just a few days ago, we concluded Annual X, a very significant multilateral exercise led by the Japanese Maritime Self-Defence Force, which included Canada, Germany and the US Navy. The upshot of these complex multi-domain exercises 
and our flagship regional engagement activity, Indo-Pacific Endeavour, was a considerable strengthening in the integration and interoperability of our forces and greater confidence and trust in our ability to work together. The presence of the US and its military forces in our region has underpinned regional peace and prosperity for decades. In the face of new challenges, Australia's alliance with the US is the strongest it has ever been. We've just announced further enhancements to the force posture initiatives, and we know that only in the last 24 hours, the United States has announced further engagement and deeper obligation to the Indo-Pacific. These include, of course, for our own country, further enhanced cooperation through all domains and establishing a combined logistics, sustainment and maintenance enterprise to support high-end war fighting and combined military operations in the region. It's been welcomed by our friends and our partners as further evidence of our joint commitment to a peaceful Indo-Pacific. The decision to acquire nuclear-powered submarines with our US and UK allies as the first initiative of the AUKUS Enhanced Trilateral Partnership represents a massive step forward in Australia's capability. The recent signing of the AUKUS Exchange of Naval Nuclear Propulsion Information Agreement demonstrates the seriousness of all parties in accelerating Australia's acquisition of this critical capability. AUKUS is more than submarines though. It's a framework to enable deeper practical cooperation in developing leading edge military capabilities and technologies. It will help ensure that Australia remains a responsible and highly capable security partner in the Indo-Pacific region for decades to come. AUKUS is just one example of a broader deepening of our partnerships with others in the region. And while we all share an interest in security in the region, these partnerships are to a very large extent built on shared values and shared history. They've been built over time with trust baked in at every point. The strength and durability of some partnerships I think is often underestimated and their development as defence security partnerships often overlooked. For instance, Australia and Japan are obviously both very strong democracies. We both have alliances with the United States. We're both members of the Quad and our economies are deeply intertwined with a free trade agreement that is one of the most comprehensive ever signed by Australia. Our special strategic partnership grows closer every year. At this year's 2 plus 2 meeting, we both reaffirmed our determination to deepen cooperation to promote a free, open, inclusive and prosperous Indo-Pacific where disputes are resolved peacefully without the threat of or use of force or coercion. Our Defence Forces are also increasing their joint training and strengthening interoperability. Last year, our two Prime Ministers announced in principle agreement on a reciprocal access agreement. This will be a landmark bilateral agreement for both countries, facilitating cooperative activities such as joint exercises and disaster relief operations between the Japan Self-Defence Forces and the Australian Defence Force. In this year, where we celebrate the 60th anniversary of Australian diplomatic relations with the Republic of Korea, we agreed to build on South Korea's inaugural participation in Exercise Talisman Sabre. We're also in the final steps of developing an annual bilateral infantry exercise that will commence in 2023. If we look to another successful 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue this year, I can say that Australia and India's defence relationship is at a historic high, especially in the maritime domain. In fact, we're reinforcing each other's maritime domain awareness through increased information sharing and practical cooperation. Both of us are committed to the ongoing success of Exercise Malabar. And we've invited India to participate in future Talisman Sabre exercises to drive further operational compatibility between our defence services. You can also see these long-standing relationships of trust at work in cyber cooperation. The Director General of the Australian Signals Directorate recently described the Five Eyes as a genuine, fully integrated partnership built on trust and confidence, which delivers the most impactful intelligence in the world. Australia is a leader in cyber regional capacity and we've continued to build that through our contribution to the Pacific Cyber Security Operational Network, providing advice and assistance to our closest neighbours. It's these partnerships which build our collective cyber resilience, allowing us to defend and act against those who threaten us through cyberspace. When this government came to power in 2013, defence spending was at the lowest level since 1938, at around 1.5% of GDP. 
We've lifted it beyond 2% of GDP because that's what's required to equip the ADF with the kit it needs and to keep Australia safe and secure. We're maintaining our investment in our core military capabilities and continuing to develop new ones to hold the potential adversaries' forces and infrastructure at risk from a greater distance. Capabilities which send a clear deterrent message to any adversary that the cost they would incur in threatening our interests outweighs the benefits of doing so. The Indo-Pacific we seek has Australia as a strong and reliable partner, a nation that more than lifts its weight in securing peace in our region. Australia can be relied upon to work for the Indo-Pacific where sovereignty is respected, which is open and free, and which is stable and secure. Thank you for your remarks, Minister Dutton, and thank you, Michael. I'm Ben Scott, Director of the Project on Australia's Security and the Rules-Based Order, and the convener of this conference. Mr Dutton's overview of Australia's military partnerships and recent capability developments, coupled with his description of the Indo-Pacific that Australia seeks, leads us straight to our third session. Our final panel is titled Hard Power and Regional Order. It will be chaired by Dr Leslie Seebeck. Dr Seebeck is Honorary Professor of Cybersecurity at the Australian National University. She has had a wide-ranging career across government, in private industry and at two universities. In government, she's worked at the departments of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Defence, and at the Office of National Assessments. Over to you, Leslie. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Ben. As Ben mentioned, my name's Leslie Seebeck. I'm an honorary professor at the Australian National University. We're here today to discuss hard power and regional order. After I introduce the panel, we'll have a couple of rounds of quick dis discussion, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So I encourage you to post your questions on the Q&A panel on your screen. I'd like to keep it fairly flexible and see where the discussion takes us. We also have a poll running, so please take a moment to respond. I'm joined this afternoon by an impressive panel. I'd like to welcome first Mr. Greg Moriarty, the Secretary of the Australian Department of Defence, Ms. Lisa Curtis, Fellow and Director of the Indo-Pacific Program at the Centre for New American Security, and Dr. Evan Laxmana, from the University of, sorry, I'm sorry, from the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan School of Public Policy. Good afternoon to all. We've just heard from the Australian Minister for Defence, Mr. Peter Dutton. Mr. Dutton has reinforced some recent themes, notably China's development of military capability, the developing cooperation between regional partners, and Australia's continued development of classic deterrence capabilities. These themes go to the heart of our discussion. So I'd like to start by asking the panel to address those particular elements. Is the focus right? How do you see these settings change over the short, medium and long term? And what concerns you most about meeting our objectives? Lisa, if I could pass to you in the first instance, please. Great, well, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, yeah, I think uh, this focus is uh, the right focus for Australia. And I think, uh, you know, everybody is waiting to hear uh, what the Biden administration will articulate with its China strategy and with the Indo-Pacific strategy, which of course is uh, really a subset of its overall China strategy. And I think what you'll hear from uh, both those strategies when they're articulated is a great deal of focus on the development of um, alliances and partnerships. And it really will be, uh, particularly the Indo-Pacific strategy, the blueprint for how the administration wants to move forward with its alliances and partnerships uh, in this vital region. And that, you know, if the goal of China is to reduce America's regional influence and create a closed operating system uh, in the Indo-Pacific, I think that the, the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy will demonstrate that that goal is not going to be reached anytime soon. Um, I think that the Indo-Pacific strategy will, uh, you know, emphasize uh, partnerships, as I was saying, alliances, uh, particularly with Australia. Of course, this is one of the most important uh, alliances for the United States, as demonstrated by AUKUS. Uh, and that demonstrates a significant security commitment to Australia, 
So uh, emphasizing that idea of partnership, working together, collective deterrence, um, that, that's certainly an example of that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, AUKUS is, is certainly an important military pact, uh, but it's also Im important because it allows Australia to acquire uh, different kinds of weapon systems, um, enhances its cyber capabilities um, and undersea capabilities. Uh, so it really does have the potential to transform the Australian military and uh, provided that ability to be able to partner with principal allies uh, moving forward. So I, I think it, uh, AUKUS is, is a great example of how uh, our countries will be working together for collective deterrence. Um, and certainly the United States values its uh, close partnership with Australia. Okay, thank you. Evan, if I could move to you, what's your reaction to Minister Dustin's speech? Um, I fully agree with Lisa that the approach, uh, the outline of the problems and the potential solutions does seem to work uh, well for Australia and, and the US. I am, however, less convinced that it works for everybody else in Southeast Asia. Uh, I don't think that the first list of strategic challenges always includes China. Uh, the kind of a particular challenge that China poses to Australia isn't always the kind of particular threat uh, viewed by the rest of Southeast Asia. On a daily basis, a Southeast Asian countries have to deal with a wide range of operational security challenges, uh, whether it's transnational organized crime, illegal fishing and others, as well as long-term strategic ones, including a potential conflict over the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea. So I think uh, in terms of the list of things that Southeast Asian countries are worried about, uh, I think we need to be careful that uh, we don't always uh, see eye to eye with Australia or the U.S. about the things that are shaping uh, uh, the strategic trajectory of the region today. Uh, so because of that, I don't think that um, uh, the kinds of solutions, whether it's about uh, working together in terms of military exercises or AUKUS, uh, we're not saying it's a bad thing but we're not also saying that it also works best for Southeast Asian states. I think the challenge is finding a way for whatever mechanism that Australia and the US develops also works well and complement existing mechanisms that Southeast Asians prefer. And I don't think uh, this is the end of the conversation. I think it's the beginning of the conversation, how to get there, uh, because I think at heart, um, we cannot start with the premise that uh, everyone shares the same assumptions and perception about rules-based order, about the strategic challenge to that uh, rules-based order, as well as the potential solution. So we shouldn't assume uh, away uh, the different uh, nuances and perceptions and daily policy challenges faced by Southeast Asian countries. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Evan. Greg, um, I'm not expecting that you're going to debate the focus of Minister Dustin's speech. So you might want to um, draw out particularly what, what concerns you about how we're going to do, or how Australia is going to deliver on this over the short to medium and even longer term. Yeah, well, thanks, Leslie. And uh, I think from an Australian defence policy perspective, we in, in many ways agree with uh, the point that Evan made that not, not all of the security challenges in the region are, uh, should be seen through the the lens of, of great power competition. Uh, a lot of what uh, D Australian Defence uh, Department and now ADF has been doing with their regional partnerships in, in Southeast Asia has, has been on that broader range of, of security agenda. Uh, the the counterterrorism work, which is deep and, and, and enduring new security challenges around, around cyber, a lot of the stuff on maritime domain awareness which does uh, help uh, our partners around the region deal with some of those challenges of illegal fishing, some of the um, uh, people, people movements. And, and many of the countries of, of Southeast Asia also still have an in internal security challenges that they appropriately uh, do, uh, do what need uh, to focus on. So I think our, I think our uh, approach, our defence strategic update last year, I think, uh, said that we, we are going to continue with, to work with partners on their agenda as well as 
to uh, to complement uh, with some of our broader concerns about those big uh, strategic shifts, which we we do think have uh, eroded uh, our strategic circumstance. And and to pick up Lisa's point, uh, it, it is our view that. The, uh, anything that led to a reduction in the United States presence and its multidimensional presence in our region uh, would not be to the advantage of either Australia, certainly Australia, but we would argue the broader region. So we we do welcome uh, that that alliance that they have with Australia, but also the U.S. security partnerships with with a, a wide range of countries in in Southeast Asia. We want to contribute more. Uh, to collective deterrence, and we certainly want to build our military capability so that we can make uh, a more of a of a contribution in an environment where the risk of of military conflict we think is is has increased uh, in recent years. This is not to say that we uh, wish to um, uh, reduce our, our, our sovereignty. We, we certainly don't see AUKUS and the acquisition of additional capabilities. We don't, we don't see deepening our uh, alliance with the United States as undermining uh, our own sovereign capability. We want to take more responsibility for our own security and we think growing our conventional capabilities will allow Australia to do that. But we certainly want to talk about what we can do to uh, make a stronger contribution to regional stability. And we think our alliance with the United States does contribute to regional stability. Okay. Greg, if I could stay with you, you've noted that we're not just interested in the, you know, again, the regions being not being shaped by great power competition, or that's not the only shaper of, of the regional order. And AUKUS itself is has been characterised by some as being a shift, major shift in Australia's strategic posture. How do you think it actually complements what we're doing? Because often it's being played as uh, this is something very different versus what we're doing on the, you know, on the ground in terms of uh, things like counterterrorism, cyber, etc., humanitarian actions. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I think or AUKUS will uh, deliver capability and technology, which will allow us to prosecute our strategy more effectively. Um, in Australia, we believe that uh, in recent years, we've lost capability edge. Uh, and in some, in some uh, critical areas now, we, we, uh, we are playing catch up in terms of high end military capabilities. What we are very optimistic is that through through AUKUS we will be able to deliver some of these very uh, exquisite military technologies with our uh, great partners, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, and it will allow us to prosecute our military strategy more effectively. We are a small country with a small defence force. If 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 we do not rely on technology, on capability edge, we will not be able to deliver the sort of deterrent effects that have long been part of our, of our, uh, of our military strategy. It, we need to remain interoperable with the United States. Uh, we need, we want to be able to conduct those uh, complex high-end ex exercises with the United States and other partners. And I think through the AUKUS uh, agreement, we will be able to acquire and develop some of those technologies which will allow Australia to continue to play that role that we've traditionally sought to in, in terms of the region's security. Okay, thank you. Evan, I just want to tease out something you had said before about Southeast Asia. I think it's fair to say that Southeast Asia is a pivot point of that changing strategic order. How would you characterise regional approaches to China, you know, and to shifts in the global balance? I mean, it's clearly a concern. How 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 would uh, regional nations and how can that region contribute to that change order to the broader stability in the in the region? Right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, there is no single Southeast Asian approach uh, to the changing power. Uh, I think it's clear that every country uh, has its own concerns and. And issues. I think on one uh, set of concerns when it comes to the U.S. and China, 
uh, and their strategic competition, some Southeast Asian uh, countries might actually see it as an opportunity uh, to balance one power over the other while trying to benefit uh, from both, uh, whether it's about uh, trade war or security partnerships. The more uh, some countries are concerned uh, about China, the more they can get goodie bags from the U.S. basically. Uh, so it depends on, on, on the sets of, uh, of perceptions of opportunities and challenge. Uh, but others might see the U.S.-China competition as fundamentally uh, polarizing the region because of uh, what is now known as issue linkages, that you cannot make a deal about infrastructure without getting pushback about debt trap diplomacy. You cannot make a deal with Huawei without a pushback on technology concerns. So this issue linkages, uh, because of of the polarizing nature of great power politics are also viewed uh, in Southeast Asia uh, as, as potentially bad. So it could be good or bad, depending, I think, on the uh, political calculations of the individual states. The second set of concerns, I think, and, and, and this is more closely about the approaches, not every country has the same set of strategic options. Some country uh, in Southeast Asia, including um, Indonesia, are over-reliant on ASEAN and multilateral institutions and less capable of developing non-ASEAN uh, strategic options. Other countries like Singapore and Vietnam are more willing to contemplate and formulate non-ASEAN strategic options. Um, so the approaches I think uh, will be shaped by these two uh, set of issues, whether uh, they're confident enough uh, in their strategic autonomy to develop a wide range of strategic options and whether or not they feel they're confident in terms of exploiting uh, the US-China competition because at heart, None of us feel that we can actually uh, get the U.S. and China to be nice to one another. Uh, that ship has sailed, I think. Uh, we tried uh, uh, talking to them. Uh, we tried to push them in the more uh, dialogue format. It doesn't work. So all we can do now is to deal with uh, uh, how things are right now. Hmm. Lisa, this is an interesting point that Evans picked up about, again, the approaches of China and the, between the U.S. and China. Certainly the ethos that has dominated policy to China for quite a long time, the idea of convergence, that engagement which make China look perhaps a bit more like us or be prepared to accommodate us has run aground. How, do you, how would you describe that shift in thinking? Is that something that's really just suddenly come to, to, um, into play now? Is it sort of being a growing uh, realisation? You know, and how is that being... Uh, sent or passed on to regional nations about how that shift is going to play out? Well, I think it's been growing for a while. And I, I think, you know, I would characterize it a, a bit differently than, than Evan did. Um, this is really about the uh, future regional order. Um, it's not as if, you know, uh, the, the U.S. is just engaging in competition with China for no reason. Um, this is really about what the region is going to look like, whether it is uh, free, open, uh, you have freedom of navigation, free trade, um, or whether it's going to be a, a sort of closed system, you know, dominated uh, by China, dominated by uh, um, Chinese technologies, uh, et cetera. So it's really about choice, about um, the Southeast Asian nations having choices um, and, and, you know, nobody is trying to, to force them to choose between one or the other, uh, China or the United States, but rather that they can make their own choice, that they have the, the independence, uh, the sovereignty to be able to make their own choices, whatever that, that might be. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. But, but yes, I think the, the idea that, um, engagement alone is going to change the character of the Chinese Communist Party uh, has certainly proven false. Mm -hmm. And there was a growing realization, I think, happening even before the Trump administration, but it, it definitely crystallized during the Trump administration. And I think, you know, President Xi's uh, ambitions have come into clearer focus over uh, the last few years. And certainly the COVID-19 pandemic, the aftermath of that pandemic, some of the aggressive behavior that China engaged in, whether it was at the border with India, uh, in the Southeast China Sea, uh, the crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, the aggressive behavior toward Taiwan, uh, threatening Taiwan autonomy, all of these things um, sort of came together in the last uh, couple of years uh, to really solidify 
the the position on China. And there was some question when we had the change in administration, uh, would the policies change? People even wondered whether the Biden administration would continue to use the Indo-Pacific terminology. Um, but clearly what we've seen over the last nine months is that the policy is largely consistent from the previous administration. Of course, there's been some differences. I would say the Biden administration has put more time, resources, and attention into building alliances and partnerships, not only in Asia, but also the transatlantic partnerships. Um, but but by and large, the, the policy toward China has, has remained the same. Um, so again, you know, coming back to the, the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, I think, you know, that's going to be very telling in terms of uh, what the administration is going to look at in terms of cooperation. Um, and it, it's not just a military strategy. Obviously, there's going to be quite a bit about cooperating with countries on climate change, um, counterterrorism, as you mentioned, um, economics, uh, you know, providing infrastructure alternatives, post-pandemic recovery. Uh, so I think there will be a lot of different elements uh, to the Indo-Pacific strategy, but, but really driving toward that idea of making sure that the region evolves in a direction that is maintains the traditional um, policies that have been in place for so many years, so many decades now to um, promote a liberal, economic, and political, peaceful order, um, and that uh, you don't have hegemonic behavior or um, countries trying to change the territorial status quo. Um, I really, I think that's what this is about, and, and that is what the, um, the efforts to maintain a strong U.S. presence across the political, economic, military domains is really all about in this uh, critical Indo-Pacific region. Okay. Can I just have a quick follow-up to that? Do you see a lot of this uh, work of the United States in the region through institutions, or is it very much on a bilateral, we we'll work with nations? And if through institutions, is there anything in particular that you would nominate? Well, I think certainly the Quad uh, has become a central pillar of the Indo-Pacific strategy of this administration. Um, you know, I would note, um, being part of the Trump administration, that uh, it was revived in 2017, the Quad was, after a 10-year hiatus. But certainly the Biden administration has taken it to the next level, um, holding two summit-level engagements in a six-month period, the first ever in-person meeting at the White House on uh, September 24th, issuing a, a very robust joint statement. Um, but this is a, uh, a grouping that's focused on economics, technology, uh, uh, global health. It's not the military pact that we see with the AUKUS. It has quite a different focus. Um, and I, you know, I know that um, there is skepticism of the Quad within the ASEAN countries or some fear, I guess, that the Quad would somehow usurp the role of ASEAN. But I would just make the point that um, the two organizations are uh, complementary. They, they have two different purposes, right? ASEAN is serving a very distinct purpose, convening the Southeast Asian nations, building consensus on important issues, um, Whereas the Quad uh, is really asserting this uh, very particular vision for the region um, and has capabilities to, to carry that vision out and, and ASEAN can benefit from the Quad activities. I would say the two benefit from each other. Um, and ASEAN you know, may be the center of the contest that we're seeing in the Indo-Pacific but it's really U.S. partnerships with um, other powerful Indo-Pacific democratic nations that is going to help um, in winning the contest. So really, I, I would say that there's uh, no contradictions between having both a strong quad cooperation and strong ASEAN um, 
uh, cooperation and and uh, I think both institutions are important to the regional architecture. Okay. I'm going to go to Evan and come back to Greg in a moment. But Evan, I want to go to you because you've actually, your latest last piece, which you did for um, Lowy, was uh, raising the point about institutions require domestic legitimacy. And you exhibited some skepticism about how some of these institutions that were being proposed, including things like the Quad, were going to move forward and be successful. Can you comment on, on that, please? Sure. Um, so for me, I think now, precisely because of uh, the increasingly polarization of our politics, um, on the other hand, I think domestically across the region, uh, more regional countries are becoming much more inward looking. The wave of domestic populism is becoming much stronger. Uh, under these conditions, I think uh, for any kind of foreign policy initiatives or engagement, including uh, multilateral institutions like ASEAN or minilateral ones like what? I think it requires a domestic buy-in uh, for sustainability and not just geopolitical interests and, and strategic challenges. And I think there's two ways in which uh, uh, regional institutions uh, or mechanisms uh, shape domestic legitimacy. One is to uh, public goods, to what extent these regional institutions uh, provide public goods that's visible uh, beyond just norms building, uh, but to what extent it can provide roads, it can provide investment and stuff like that. And secondly, of course, because this is still very much an elite-driven uh, region, uh, to what extent these regional institutions provide private benefits uh, to the domestic elites. And I think this is something uh, that's very tricky because if China can do both, provide public goods and private benefits to the elites, uh, it'll be harder for the U.S. to compete on those particular issue areas. So it isn't about just uh, uh, sidelining China because we disagree with how they do business on the infrastructure round, but what's the alternative for the domestic elites? Uh, should they all abandon engaging China on infrastructure projects and then do what exactly uh, for their domestic public? So for me, uh, multilateral institutions work the same way. Uh, there's a recent uh, study by ASEAN uh, Secretariat that actually shows, interestingly, in Indonesia, among the next generation of students, they're actually very skeptical of what ASEAN can do for Indonesia. Um, so there is, I think, a growing sense that multilateral institutions uh, uh, and their norms building exercises has to do more uh, than just provide a photo opportunity and a way to discuss policies behind closed doors. But if it's not uh, presented to the public as providing public goods, and it's not being seen by the elites as providing private benefits to them, I think it would be harder to sustain. Okay, thank you. Greg, I'm going to um, pose to you one of the first questions we have from our audience. So this is a question from Mick Kilty. Building on Evan's observation of multi-dimensional strategic partnering by some ASEAN countries, how much should we look beyond AUKUS to like-minded democracies in Europe who face similar cyber and defense threats from Russia? Are we learning from their lessons and lived experiences? Well, I, th I, I think um, we should be open to all sorts of uh, partnerships to, to reinforce old ones and to develop new ones. There are, there's a very rich uh, depth of expertise in, in Europe about a number of these hybrid th uh, threats, grey zone challenges that they've they've had to deal with, uh, in, in, in from from Russia, we we should very much be open to working with them on on some of these uh, broader international challenges. We we should be open open to working with uh, old old partners in you know in in terms of the five power defence arrangements. Uh, there's a number of. Uh, engagements in, in, in Southeast Asia, where we've had long-standing uh, relationships that have delivered benefits, I think, to, to us and to our, our regional partners. So I, I don't think we, it, we in Australia are looking to be exclusionary. I, I think that the, the uh, AUKUS agreement is, is an, an amazing opportunity for Australia to, to uh, work uh, with great, uh, very deep and old partners on uh, incredible technologies uh, that op offer us the opportunity to enhance our, our security. But I think we want to do more with a, a range of, of different partners. And I think we want to 
uh, work with with the region across the Indo-Pacific uh, on on a number of reinforcing relationships where wherever we can. There's some some of those are, are more about hard edge military capability, and I think uh, AUKUS uh, is focused on on that. It's a, it's about delivering uh, high end technologies for our defence forces. And that that's what I see. It's primary uh, purposes as being reinforcing old partnerships to deliver capability. It sends it sends strong, a strong strategic message. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I think all the, the three leaders in there, when they announced focus, were very clear what they suggested it should be. Uh, our relationships with Europe, and we certainly w welcome uh, European interest in the Indo-Pacific, and including uh, I should mention with, with France, which is a genuine Indo-Pacific power and has very substantial, uh, long-standing presence uh, in the region. We should be looking to uh, cooperate with France and other European powers uh, in our region and more broadly. But with, with uh, for example, Australia's uh, bilateral defence relationship with Indonesia is very much uh, growing in, in positive ways in, in, in recent years. And we we see that as a, a uh, as a as a broader benefit, we have largely bilateral defence relationships with the countries of Southeast Asia, apart from the, the five power defence arrangements, which have historical reasons for their existence, but have been able to adjust to new circumstances. And all of the, the members of, of that grouping have, have found benefit in, in the new agenda that we've been pursuing through uh, FPDA. So I, I think uh, we are certainly open to and enthusiastic about building uh, on traditional relationships, but also uh, broadening networks. Okay. I'm hearing a lot of optimism about these regional groupings um, from both yourself, Greg, and Lisa. Uh, some skepticism from Evan. I think if you look back over a period of time in the Asia Pacific, there is a it has a history of these groups that keep coming up from APEC, FPDA. You mentioned has been long-standing. Mm. Is it the case that we put too much weight on some of these things so that they, you know, sort of collapse under the weight of expectations? It's those slower moving groupings that bear fruit longer term? And if that is the case, if you agree with that, do you think we have time for, to, you know, for these to reach you know, fruition, to, to generate the outcomes we're after? I'll go to you first, then, Greg, and I might also pass that on to Lisa as well. well I, Leslie, I think we, we are optimistic for what that network of relationships can do in terms of building re, uh, resilience, but um, Supporting the, the the rules, the the uh, the dynamic of of the region, which has largely and uh, ASEAN uh, has has benefited from uh, its its focus. We all know it's evolved o over time from the original reasons why ASEAN came into being. But I, I think we should celebrate ASEAN's achievements as much as we might wish to sort of hope that ASEAN would assert more of a sort of a strategic presence or a strategic personality. But at the end of, at the, end of the day, that is why I think the topic of this session is we, we need, we cannot assure ourselves, we cannot assume given the trends that we're seeing that it will be uh, sufficient. That is why Australia is reinvesting in defence capability. That is why we are seeking to be more interoperable with our ally, the United States. That's why we are putting more emphasis on the ability to acquire capabilities, including long range strike that can hold adversaries at risk at longer distance. So while we are optimistic about what these networks can deliver, we also believe that given that what we are seeing uh, what we are seeing in terms of coercive activities, what we are seeing in terms of uh, activities in the region that uh, undermine our strategic interests, we have to invest in conventional military capability and seek to uh, ensure deterrence, but our ability to prosecute our interests through the use of force if, if the circumstances uh, ever became so appalling uh, and that we would be required to do so.
Okay, thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I think that it's good to have these evolving architectures or groupings. Um, and, you know, there's a certain um, organic nature to them as well. And we've talked a lot about the quad and we've heard about quad plus or would there be other countries that would come in and cooperate with quad countries on an issue by issue basis. And I think this is very important. Um, we are facing um, many challenges uh, and, you know, we can't ignore the fact that um, China, in a way, is, is seeking to disrupt the, you know, traditional international order as we know it and uh, trying to, you know, stake uh, territorial claims, um, trying to dominate the emerging and critical technologies. Uh, so, you know, there, there are good reasons for allowing these groupings to come together and to, to, to work together on some of these challenges. So I, I don't really um, think that we have to expect, um, you know, a very um, firm or, you know, long-term type of architecture. I think it's okay that we, we see um, new groupings coming up, we see, uh, trilateral groupings of different, you know, countries, uh, whether it's, you know, Japan, U.S., Australia, or, you know, maybe um, Australia, India, uh, Korea, I don't know, just there, there's been uh, several different um, trilateral groupings, mini lateral groupings, and, and I think this makes sense um, to allow countries to come together, like-minded countries, even if it's around particular issues, but to work together. Because I think that um, the challenges are, are great. The U.S. Um, is not going to be able to go it alone. Uh, certainly, the Biden administration recognizes that and has been uh, working to, to not only build that quad grouping, build its bilateral relationships with countries like Australia, uh, Japan, and others, but also uh, working with the European nations, um, the G7. I think uh, it was quite remarkable to see the G7 and its statement mentioning um, the need for a stable, stable Taiwan Straits, um, talking about uh, human rights issues, some of the human rights abuses we're seeing in China against the Uyghurs, um, and uh, initiating the B3W, um, Build Back Better World Initiative, um, which I understand we're gonna hear some announcements pretty soon about what's actually happening, infrastructure projects um, across the world. Uh, so I think you know quite a bit has been achieved in terms of uh, working with other nations and other groupings. And you know I, th I think it's okay that these are flexible, these are evolving um, and are fairly organic. And that's probably what we're going to continue to see uh, in the coming months and years. Okay. I do want to come back to you, uh, Lisa, in particular around the question of technology and the effect of technology on security stability, and particularly China's role. But I want to take another question from the uh, audience. Um, and this is to all panelists. So we might start um, with uh, Evan and then go down to Greg and Lisa. Uh, to all panelists, to maintain regional peace, does America need to remain the strongest military power or can peace be secured by a balance of power with China? Evan? Uh, thank you. That's a pretty difficult question. Um, I think there are two different layers uh, to that question. First layer is, of course, uh, uh, the US-China strategic balance. I think uh, clearly there is no single country uh, in Asia that can militarily uh, challenge China uh, by themselves. Uh, so clearly on that front, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, remains a necessary piece of the security border. But the second layer is what, what does the rest of the region do? Uh, uh, because uh, they also cannot uh, always rely on the U.S. Uh, they also have their own qualms and concerns about uh, being too dependent on the U.S. for military assurances. So for me, I think right now, the key difficult question is if there is 
a prospect for, uh, for some form of multipolar security order below the level of the U.S. and China, uh, that would have to mean that the middle powers of the region would not only have to build their own defense capabilities, uh, but also network among themselves separate from their own networks uh, with the U.S. and, and extra regional powers. And I think this is uh, the more difficult question uh, because I think some parts of the region still feel it's easier to just rely on the U.S. Uh, it's less complicated, uh, but, uh, but others who do realize that they need more options outside the U.S. also don't have the resources and capabilities uh, to do so, especially when their economic growth and ties are so dependent on China as well. So I think this is uh, uh, the more difficult question. Uh, but clearly, uh, the idea that a unipolar uh, moment of, of U.S. military power in the region has passed, a stable a bilateral uh, um, um, or sorry, a stable bipolar um, a balance of power between U.S. and China militarily may also not be sustainable. Uh, so I think uh, this leads us to the question of how do we get the rest of the region uh, to step up militarily. Mm -hmm. Greg? Yeah, Leslie, I, th I think it, it's, it's, there is a, a question in my mind about whether uh, you know, we can have uh, a, a region where the great powers do cooperate, compete, uh, contest in a way in which, um, you know, while they'll assert their strategic preferences, but can, can they do that in a way that enhances stability and reinforces uh, international rules? Or, or do, we, do we need to resile ourselves or reconcile ourselves to a fragile and, and, and brittle balance. And I think that the United States, from my perspective, is not talking about trying to reshape the region uh, in terms of asserting territorial claims, uh, asserting, asserting its strategic predominance. I, I feel m my sense is that the United States wishes to remain an Indo-Pacific power and uh, um, is, is keen to engage with, with regions, uh, with countries of the region around that uh, agenda and 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 similarly, it, it's it's not predetermined or predestined that China uh, must pursue uh, its 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 ambitions in a way which unsettles and undermines the region's uh, security. So that uh, China has choices it can make, and the, the, there's there's aspects of China's recent behaviour which deeply concern us and the militarization of features in the South China Sea and some other uh, issues are, are, are deeply concerning to Australia. But I, I, I don't think there's, it is predestined mm -hmm. that we have a, a fragile and brittle balance of power in the region. I think there is there's scope for optimism, but uh, being Secretary of the Department of Defense, of course, I, I, I would take the the view that that robust yeah. and capable security forces are, are going to make a positive contribution to that, and I think it's I, I'm, I'm very much uh, welcome uh, efforts by our ASEAN uh, partners as well to develop more more robust security forces that can deal with uh, these 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 security challenges. Um, I think that there is there's certainly a need for. The countries, the member countries of ASEAN and more broadly across the Indo-Pacific to have capabilities mm. so that they are able to make a contribution and are not simply uh, on the receiving end of the dynamics that, uh, that the region might, might throw up. I'm looking forward to working with ASEAN partners to help shape that regional security uh, environment. Yeah, good. Thank you, Lisa. And if you could just address the issue of technology and uh, how China is playing in that field. That would be really interesting as well. Great. Yeah, well, look, I think US-China competition is here to stay. Um, you know, it's not going anywhere, uh, but this doesn't mean it has to devolve into conflict. And clearly, 
uh, just two weeks ago, we saw you know, President Biden, President Xi engaging in a nearly four hour virtual meeting. And I think both leaders were making clear um, that they, they don't wanna see conflict, that um, there are ways to, to manage the competition. Um, so I, I, I think that you know, that's important to remember. Um, but as you said, the, the competition is increasingly revolving around critical and emerging technologies. Um, and I think what the pandemic showed is that uh, the United States and, and other countries don't want to be too heavily reliant on China uh, for these critical and emerging technologies because they saw what happened with regard to the PPE situation. Um, so that was really kind of a, a lesson um, that is carrying over now into the technology realm. Um, and, you know, China has uh, increased its digital footprint, particularly in Southeast Asia, um, with its, you know, 5G offerings. Uh, but I think countries are um, becoming more aware of the dangers on uh, relying, you know, too heavily on Chinese technology, um, the, the, the opportunities for um, controlling that digital environment and um, then the vulnerabilities that the countries uh, would face um, by relying on, you know, end-to-end -end 5G technology from Chinese companies. I think that there's a growing awareness about this. And what we've seen are uh, countries working together uh, to come up with other solutions. Uh, we can talk about the open radio access network, the Open RAN that is becoming more and more of a viable option for countries that would sort of open the market up um, and al allow for more market-based uh, solutions. Um, so I think that, um, you know, that the technology competition, the U.S. is starting to, to step up. Um, in the infrastructure bill that was recently passed, that, you know, there was a lot of funding put toward developing um, our own um, technology industry, encouraging innovation, um, research partnerships with other countries. Uh, the Quad, um, for instance, had a lot to say about technology cooperation when the leaders met in September. Um, and one of the, the key initiatives that came out of that quad meeting was the um, initiative to bring uh, students, master students from all four countries to the United States to study um, in the STEM fields and sort of um, encouraging that uh, cooperation and research and the synergies between the four countries um, on you know, critical technologies. And this is all very important yeah. um, in the technology uh, competition that we, we are certainly facing with China. And again, the importance of the U.S. working with uh, critical allies and partners to meet those challenges. Okay. Do you see technology as being an empowering, primarily an empowering or destabilizing, particularly digital technologies, empowering or destabilizing a regional stability and order? Uh, I think it's both, right? Yeah. <laughs> because I think the, the um, of course, digital technologies um, are empowering and the kind of benefits that they can bring to societies is, is quite evident. But I think it's, it's how you harness the technologies. And I think there's particular concern about artificial intelligence and you know how that would be used and would it be used um, ethically would it be used to um, promote um, you know civil freedoms and um, um, uh, democratic systems or would it be used to uh, repress society um, you know increase surveillance of individuals uh, taking away privacy from individuals. So those are really the key questions and why it's so important for um, democratic countries to work together to set 
the norms and the standards for these emerging technologies um, to make sure that they're used for good in society um, and to benefit the people of society and not used by authoritarian regimes uh, to repress their people. Mm, okay. Greg, given the emphasis that AUKUS has around technology, do you see a major change to Australia, you know, Australia and US, uh, UK force structures to take advantage of new technologies, artificial intelligence, cyber? Do you see a rebalancing or shifting out of, out of those? And what does that mean for things like, you know, again, as Kirk Campbell mentioned the other day, the melding of our militaries, for example, uh, and doing more with each other? Where does, where does technology route take us? Leslie, I think we are seeing some of those shifts underway uh, uh, already, right? pre AUKUS that, that we're doing a lot of thinking in Australia about whether what, what type of agile force structure do we need uh, into the future? What these, the legacy platforms that we've had for a long time, I mean, the, the, uh, there's a bit of uh, disinformation sometimes about the, the you know, large surface combatants will no longer be relevant or submarines won't be stealthy in another 20 years' time. Fifth generation fighters will be as easily discoverable as uh, jumbo jets. So the, um, and I'm sceptical that the, the revolution in, in technology will mean that all of those legacy platforms uh, are no longer relevant to the, the future of a, of a modern fighting force. But I, I, think, I, th I certainly think in our force structure plan last year that the government uh, announced there is more emphasis on space capability, more emphasis on, on, on cyber, more em emphasis on, on agility, on mobility. Uh, and I think that that trend will accelerate and I think AUKUS will also contribute to its acceleration where we are going to focus on AI and, and, and I can assure the audience that ethical use of AI is something that we are uh, very much focused on, but quantum technologies, additional undersea uh, cap capabilities, including unmanned capabilities, um, some, of the, some of the other potential capability acquisitions that we might look to un under AUKUS will just drive that, that, that change. Uh, but I see it happening. I see it happening already, Leslie. Mm -hmm. So that also implies that we would be doing some of this in the absence of AUKUS as well. And AUKUS is going to just give us that extra lift. I, yeah. well, I, I, yes, I agree. I think there's, there is some of that uh, trend. I mean, we were looking at what capabilities we might be able to acquire to hold adversaries uh, at, at risk uh, before uh, uh, we, we thought about AUKUS. And before, and in terms of that interoperability, particularly with the United States, we, at previous OSMINs, but at the OSMIN this year, again, before AUKUS, we talked about enhancing US force posture in, in in, uh, in Australia in four key areas, enhanced air cooperation, rotational yep. deployment of, of additional US um, aircraft, enhanced maritime cooperation, including logistics and sustainment capabilities, enhanced land cooperation, more complex and more integrated exercises, particularly at high end war fighting and establishing combined logistics sustainment and maintenance enterprises. So I think there is this deep deepening of the what we call operationalizing the alliance i think you know kurt, kurt talks about uh, uh, those those as seamless uh we we certainly want to be able to operate with the united states in a seamless way at, at a range of con, uh, a range of contingencies but you know of course preserving our sovereign rights as a, as, a, as a as a nation state to make make decisions about how we will deploy military forces and for what purpose okay. but but we are we are enthusiastic about operationalizing the alliance and i think through AUKUS we'll do that 
uh, in, in increasingly high technology military capability areas. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. At this point, I'm going to go to another question from the audience, and this is to Evan. And it follows on from just our discussion about technology. Uh, it's from Boris. We are hearing different things from different Indonesian leaders about AUKUS, but no criticism of China's military buildup from any of them. What does Jakarta really think about arms racing in our region? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, a couple of things. First, uh, building on, on the conversation uh, on technology and, and, and strategic choices and autonomy, I think it's, it's interesting because uh, critical technologies in defense is not some free public good that everyone can access for uh, with their own choices. Uh, CATSA is one example in which technology can be used to exclude uh, one a country from the other. Um, you know, access to U.S. technology for its operability also means that you have to develop a certain types of, of arrangements. So uh, in terms of defense technology, it's actually the, the clear example in which uh, technology actually uh, could be used to hinder uh, strategic autonomy and choices. Now, uh, this goes back to the question uh, about arms race. I think the government's position that AUKUS uh, is the beginning or sparks an arms race, I think is, is not very accurate uh, um, uh, to say the least because where have we been for the last 15 years? There's already one uh, unfolding over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, I think uh, the underlying message isn't about the validity of the arms race argument itself, but it's about the concern uh, that Indonesia is now lacking in strategic options to shape the region. Uh, uh, because the, uh, the one institution that we keep harping on, which is ASEAN, uh, is the one thing that we keep uh, relying on as our sole strategic option. So AUKUS, I think, uh, represents uh, uh, the most recent data point in which there is a reaction, counter-reaction in terms of great power politics, uh, but also in terms of uh, regional states developing non-ASEAN options. So I think for me, uh, I would not uh, take uh, the argument uh, of the Indian government's position of the arms race at face value. Uh, the third point I think that's relevant is the China question. I think it's certainly the case uh, that the contrast uh, is, is very strong, that we were so vocal about AUKUS and yet we were completely silent uh, when China was harassing our oil rig in our exclusive economic zone. So on that part, I understand and, and I get it from Australia's standpoint. But uh, why would Australia want to be in the same position as China? Uh, China is the most domestically polarizing foreign policy issue in Indonesia. The fact that we cannot say stuff about China actually tells you how precarious and volatile China's position is. And the fact that we can criticize Australia publicly and privately, I think tells you the maturity of the relationship. So yes, uh, there is a double standard, but why would Australia want to be in the same category as China uh, in terms of the difficulty of the Indonesian political elites uh, to deal with publicly? So for me, I would take uh, the AUKUS comment uh, with a bit of a of a concern, I think, uh, that Indonesia lacks uh, uh, the strategic options beyond ASEAN and the fact that I think the region is moving towards that, that trend of minilateralism uh, uh, in which uh, that means in Indonesia sooner or later have to think about do we need to expand our own minilateral options uh, with regional countries? And this is something that's harder, I think, uh, to contemplate. Mm. Greg, just on that, what would you like to see Indonesia do? You mentioned before that you'd like to see again that capability question in Indonesia. What would you? What What is it you are after there? Well, I, Leslie, I I think a, a strong, prosperous, united, democratic Indonesia is a, a a great strategic benefit to us Australia and and to ASEAN. I, I think uh, in in. Uh, a, a self-confident Indonesia can play. I know it's very, always very self-conscious about leadership and in the ASEAN context, but frankly, without Indonesia being prepared to play that leadership role, uh, I think uh, ASEAN will not reach its potential. So uh, uh, a self-confident, capable Indonesia, and, and in terms of capability, I think that that's, that includes military capability and ability to contribute more to international peacekeeping, to, to regional stabilization operations. To, to, uh, and, and Indonesia has certainly done this over the last decade and uh, 
Uh, President Yudhoyono was very interested in growing that capability, and I think in Indonesia can play that role. So I, 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 I'm optimistic that the modernization of the Indonesian armed forces, the development of, of more conventional capability, and a self-confidence about contributing in, uh, regionally and, and globally, that will be good for Australia and for the region. Mm. That's an interesting one because when you and I both joined Defence roughly the same time, Defence of Australia was the, you know, the, the, the thing of the day. That's what everyone's thinking about. And of course, Indonesia was playing, you know, had a great um, pass in that about how we're going to you know, interact with Indonesia. We seem to have matured considerably over those you know, intervening period. Yeah. And, and I think the depth of our you know, the, the depth of our intelligence discussions with Indonesia now, the, the depth of our strategic policy discussion now, the quality of our leader engagements with Indonesia are, are very different to what they were, Leslie, when you and I were, were yep. uh, engaging on these issues several decades ago. Yeah, <laughs> longer than I hate to, than I like to think about. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, the National Posture Review was recently completed. Lisa, I might go to you on this one. Uh, some commentators have expected to see more of a shift to on Asia, but that didn't seem to be particularly forthcoming. Could you give us some context around the NPR and how it sits with things like, you've mentioned before, the National Security Strategy, which is still in development. Can we expect to see a major shift uh, to Asia, to the Indo-Pacific? Uh, yeah, you know, we've got so many strategies that are coming up for, you know, the, the uh, national security strategy, of course, the China strategy, the Indo-Pacific strategy, of course, the um, China strategy will be articulated um, verbally. Um, my understanding is it won't be released as a document, but um, the Indo-Pacific strategy, the national security strategy will. Um, and I think, yes, we can expect to see a major shift uh, toward the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and, you know, I think even going back to the uh, national security strategy that was released in 2017 by the previous administration, which focused on great power competition, um, was starting to move in that direction. Um, but I think you'll see a, a marked shift um, with uh, the one that's about to be uh, released. Um, and, you know, it will, uh, again, focus on partnerships, alliances, uh, how we need to, to build those. Um, you know, it, it'll focus on uh, the U.S. Uh, military capabilities um, and, you know, how those need to be geared toward Asia, um, you know, building that network of alliances that we've heard so much about, um, talking about integrated deterrence, uh, which I understand is, is really talking about three levels of integrated deterrence. One, it's talking about uh, the U.S. using uh, all different tools of power, not just military, economic, political. So that's integrated deterrence, um, how we're having a sort of holistic deterrence that we're looking at. Uh, second is integrating all types of military power, whether it's electro electronic warfare, conventional, nuclear, um, hypersonics, uh, and making sure that, that there's integration of all those elements of military power. And then lastly, integrated deterrence with regard to uh, partnerships and alliances and, and um, integrating in those uh, different partnerships. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll hear much more about that, integrated deterrence. We'll hear about network of alliances, um, uh, so, you know, I think that these are the things that we can expect from the strategies um, that, that are about to, to be uh, released. And, um, you know, there, there may be some differences within the administration on, on certain, you know, critical issues. Um, but I think, uh, you know, by and large, there is this developing consensus 
about the need uh, to, to meet the challenges from China, mm. address uh, the, the nuclear challenges and, and the need for strategic stability talks with China. You know, we've had strategic stability talks with Russia for years, but there is now an awareness that we need to have similar talk, talks or at least work toward having such talks with China. Mm. Okay. So out of that, Greg, do we, are we expecting more forward basing, uh, more equipment, more infrastructure here in Australia from the US in particular? Leslie, I think under, under the, um, the enhanced um, US force posture cooperation that our ministers discussed at uh, Orpmin this year, uh, or Osmin, sorry. Um, yeah, we, we will. I mean, there, there will be that enhanced air cooperation uh, in combined logistics, sustainment and, and maintenance, uh, enhanced more exercises, more complex exercises, more uh, more exercises at high end in, and war fighting. I'm expecting to see in the in the coming years more U.S. Uh, presence in, in in Australia, and I would also hope uh, in in the region. Um, I think I think having that uh, U.S. military presence in in the region, working with regional partners, is 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 good for the region as well. So yes, very much looking forward to growing the the uh, the the complexity and the the nature of the u.s force posture presence in australia but also hoping that the u.s deepens its military engagement with all of the asean partners as well yeah okay thank you i should note that the last question was also from case she's a member of our audience mm -hmm. uh, i'm going to go to another uh audience question uh from lai ha uh and i might pass it to uh evan in this case Will the growth of mini, mini lateral groupings, for example, Quad, AUKUS, and many trilateral groupings in the region eventually undermine the function and role of traditional multilateralism? What is the prospect for both, for both of them, the mini lateral and the multilateral? Um, I want to pick up earlier on, on, um, on what Lisa said about how Quad and ASEAN are not actually in contradiction with one another. I would add, in fact, that uh, Quad's revival is partially facilitated uh, through ASEAN meetings that they met on the sidelines of ASEAN meetings. So in, in that sense, I think there's nothing uh, that's inherently or fundamentally necessary that the growth of Quad means uh, the downfall of ASEAN. I think ideally in the past uh, when uh, regional uh, policymakers had um, crafted the idea of an ASEAN-led regional architecture, uh, the aspiration back then was to create in the future some sort of functional uh, differentiation in which uh, different issue areas would be handled by different ASEAN-led mechanisms. Um, in some ways, ASEAN would like to be the hub uh, and, and the spokes would be the uh, East Asia Summit for kind of high-level uh, diplomatic meetings, uh, the ADMM Plus uh, for defense issues, uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum for sort of more non-traditional ones, and APAC for sort of more economic ones. So that was the initial vision that uh, uh, ASEAN as the hub and ASEAN-led mechanisms in which regional countries uh, are not excluded from one uh, institution can participate. Uh, but the rise of unilateral uh, groupings like uh, and others, I do think forces uh, regional countries to rethink uh, uh, the, uh, that aspiration. Uh, because I think the problem with ASEAN-led mechanism is the obsession over processes, uh, that everything has to be done uh, with consensus. And because the issues are so wide ranging, uh, it's easier to get a consensus on lowest common denominator uh, positions rather than difficult ones. Um, so I think this is where uh, the functional differentiation is now shifting rather than an ASEAN-led mechanisms for different issue areas. Right now, it's ASEAN-led mechanisms for normative diplomatic conversations and unilateral ones for more practical but limited uh, security or other issue areas, uh, whether it's quad uh, in terms of Indo-Pacific or Indonesia's version of unilateral cooperation, like with Malaysia and Singapore over the Malacca Straits or with the Philippines and Malaysia over the Sulu Sea. So I think uh, unilateral uh, options are good to think about right now in terms of filling specific and uh, yet limited uh, 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 needs, uh, whether in the security realm of others, uh, while uh, the ASEAN side uh, kind of still uh, deals with the normative side of things 
uh, uh, um, over the broader region. But the, the issue I think is not so much what ASEAN as a group can do, but who's gonna lead ASEAN uh, to do the things it needs to be done. Uh, and I think Greg mentioned it uh, very clearly that Indonesia is supposed to be the one uh, that's doing the leading. But right now, uh, to be honest, uh, we're not very uh, uh, energetic in that front. In fact, we're, we seem to be more constrained uh, by ASEAN institutions than the other way around. Uh, so th this, I think, uh, requires a more fundamental rethinking in Jakarta, not just in terms of the defense transformation process. As Greg mentioned, military capability is one element. And I think for Indonesia, a military procurement alone is not the answer. Uh, we have a long problem. A long list of problems on the organizational and human capital side we have to work out. Uh, but more importantly, it's Indonesia's strategic policy making system uh, that needs a complete overhaul. How the defense can work together with the foreign ministry, with the economic side of things uh, to actually develop options uh, um, uh, in terms of institutions. Because right now, we are conflating chairmanship of G20 uh, and, um, and ASEAN um, in 2023 as leadership. And this is something that we uh, have to grapple ourselves. Okay, thank you, Evan. I notice that we're in under the last four or five minutes of this panel. Uh, so I'm going to ask one, Greg, one final question and then just ask people for um, if they could give me their one takeaway on hard power and regional order. Before I do, I'm just noting the, uh, the polls uh, results that uh, the outcomes are that, yes, the vote is that the... The US military presence in the Indo-Pacific does make the region stronger. Uh, the Quad and AUKUS makes the reg regional order stronger. And the overall, the highest vote has been that uh, military conflict between US and China is unlikely in the next five years. So that's probably re somewhat reassuring. Greg, I can't let you go without asking the question, are we going to have nuclear powered submarines in time to make a difference for the power balance in the Indo-Pacific? Well, Leslie, the, the government's committed to uh, delivering the capability as, as early as, as possible, but I'd also say we have a very capable Collins-class fleet, which will remain, uh, deliver us a regionally superior submarine capability for many years to come. Uh, but it's not just us. We, we have a, a really strong uh, cooperation on undersea warfare with the United States with us. With, with, with other partners. So we, we believe that the Australian Defence Force, including our submarine fleet, uh, will continue uh, to make a difference uh, for many years to come. Terrific, thank you. Okay, so if I could ask each of you for a 30, no more than say roughly 30 seconds, quick uh, take on hard power and regional order. Greg, I might go back to you. Yeah, thank you, Les, I, I, I think hard power and, and it, it needs to adapt as circumstances change. We, we are investing more in hard power as we've identified government has responded to the deterioration in our strategic circumstances. But the multi-dimensional nature of power is, is, is essential. And, and that's why I think we, we in Australia continue to welcome uh, the US presence in the region. It's not just US military power, it's that multi-dimensional nature of US power that we believe continues to make a strong contribution to regional stability. Great, thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I, I agree with what Greg said, um, that the, the hard power is about upholding the uh, liberal uh, political economic order uh, in the Indo-Pacific region um, deterring any kind of aggression, hegemonic behavior, or um, territorial, you know, trying to change the territorial status quo. Uh, this, this is what I think when we talk about hard power uh, and U.S. cooperation, particularly the AUKUS uh, agreement, which is, um, it's an important part of uh, ensuring that we maintain this liberal uh, order in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, I think there are there will be opportunities to expand AUKUS as we move forward, um, looking at increased inter interoperability, um, information sharing, um, you know, their, their logistics cooperation. Uh, there are so many ways 
that uh, this AUKUS can be a foundation for expanding that um, uh, collective deterrence that the U.S. is working toward. Great. Thank you. Evan, we've got about 30 seconds. Uh, I think hard power is almost always necessary uh, for regional order, but it's rarely sufficient. Uh, the other elements uh, of power, as Greg mentioned, whether it's economic or political and diplomatic uh, um, institutions, I think remain a necessary piece of that puzzle. And second, I think um, regional order cannot be taken for granted that it's good uh, uh, and that people are willing to rally to, to profit. I think regional order needs to be proven uh, uh, to the domestic constituents of regional state that it's worth fighting for. And at this point, uh, uh, abstract ideas of rules-based order isn't just going to cut it. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you to the panel. That was a tremendous discussion. Thank you to Michael Fullerlove, uh, Ben, for his introduction at the Lowe Institute for the opportunity to have this discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Leslie. I'm Ben Scott, and as a convener of this conference, I'm here now to draw it to a close. Our goal over the last two days has been to explore the concept of the Indo-Pacific operating system and to ask questions about how our region works and more importantly, how it should work. These are complex and daunting questions. While we can't claim to have produced all the answers, our discussions have been productive and generated important new insights. For that, I would like to thank our speakers and participants, in particular, our keynote speakers, Kurt Campbell, Nadej Walan, and Peter Dutton. And I would like to give special thanks to those who labored tirelessly behind the scenes especially Andrea Pollard, events producer, Josh Godding, digital producer, and Sasha Fegan, research associate in the Rules-Based Order Project. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the Australian government through a grant by the Department of Defence for the Lowy Institute's research project on Australia's security and the rules-based order. The Rules-Based Order Project will continue next year. To stay up to date with this project and the rest of the Lowy Institute's work, please visit the Institute's website. For now, it's goodbye from the Lowe Institute. Thank you.